Thanks again for this uh, Christmas program. It's uh, always a joy. It's always a joy to hear the participation of all age groups and the talents, too. I think there should be more of these types of programs throughout the year. Now, as we're looking at the scriptures today, today this scripture is fulfilled. And I would just like to just kind of remark about last Sunday we talked about when the prophets of old, they saw into the future. It's like looking at mountain peaks. You really can't see how far those peaks are when you're coming along. And it looks like it's, they're all right there, but it's not. And the closer you come, the further apart you see these mountain peaks. So when Isaiah looked at Christ's first coming and second coming, and the others too, it was like all at one time to them as they looked at the prophecy and wrote the prophecy from God. But as we look at it, and as we see Christ's first coming, now we'll look today and we'll see where Christ himself is again confirming all of this prophecy of his first coming. And this is very important for us to understand in Advent season. Christ himself was looking and was helping the people go through this step by step. This is prophecy that is presently happening in front of your eyes. I am the anointed one of God. I am the, the Messiah that has come now, and I'm going to be coming again later as the King of Kings. And so when we understand that, it makes a lot more sense in the Advent season of Christ's first coming and second coming, and that there was absolutely no misunderstanding in this because Christ always said, and this is prophecy that Malachi said, or Isaiah referred to, and that now it's happening right now in front of you. And all the prophecies that Christ didn't fulfill the first time, he will fulfill the second time. And you remember when Christ talked about his second coming, and it's going to be like in the time of Noah, peace, peace. But again, I want to make sure that you understand that all the prophecy in Revelation and all is going to happen. So don't just think it's going to be peace, peace, that little, no, that is just one part of it. Let's just take, for example, today, we refresh our minds. For example, there will be wars and rumors of wars before I come. We say, well, you know, it's pretty good here. Uh, no, no, there, there's no rumors of wars and wars. Wait a minute. Now, America isn't even in the Bible, by the way. It wasn't even existing when the Bible was written. But look at the wars around the world. Will you just think of back to, starting 1900 and coming up to the present, World War I, I don't know how many million people were killed. World War II, six million Jews just exterminated. Plus millions of people. The destruction was overwhelming. Do you think it's ended? No. The rumors of war is going on right now. Look at the Middle East. Syria is absolutely destroyed. But you see, we don't even notice this in the news today. I do watch BBC, British Broadcasting, and in other parts of the world too, like in Brazil, because it's important to see what's going on around the world. In the mid, in, back in South America too, nothing but destruction of going on. Not so much wars, that's just plain governments collapsing. We just don't realize because we're not involved in it. But it's good to get online and realize what's going on in the war. Right now, Yemen is being destroyed by Saudi Arabia and Iran. Those two countries now are coming down and literally the, the babies are starving to death. People are not getting any food because that's the way that they work today in ethnic cleansing, which means they don't want this group of people in their country today. And so they just take food away from them and they just let them die. This is happening. This is happening. With Burma right now and also in Bangladesh, these people are being destroyed, this whole people group, because they're not the same group as we are. So 
we have to be aware of what's going on. Prophecy is being fulfilled every day of the Lord's second coming. Don't ever forget that. It's very, very near. You don't know how many millions of people have been killed in the wars in just the last few years. But we don't even hear about it because here, all is well. And these are things that we have to remember to pray for those people and those countries today that are being totally, totally destroyed. Now, as you look at today, the, in Advent Sunday, we're going to read from Luke, and we're going to look at Luke chapter 4, 16 to 22. Now Christ is telling what he came for the day that he read this from Isaiah, and I think it's really uh, important for us to see. And this Isaiah wrote in chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, and so Christ is saying, it's being fulfilled today when Christ walked on earth. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. It was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the freedom for the prisoners and recovery of eyesight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I am the one that Isaiah is talking about. This is about 2,000 years ago. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, these are thy words, Heavenly Father, sanctify us in thy truth. Thy word is truth. Lord, we just pray this morning as we look at why you were sent, Christ, to bind up the poor, to help those who are sick and the downtrodden, and to reach out to them, to heal the sick, to give the blind people their sight again, and to feed the 5,000, to show step by step all the way that you were the Messiah, and this was the first coming back in the New Testament era. And so, Lord, we just thank you for that. And we just thank you that you mentioned it. Every time you did those kind of miracles, you always made reference to it in the Old Testament by the prophets of old. And then, Lord, we know that as you are looking, as the world is looking for your return, you will come the second time as the King of Kings. You will take home the church, and that is made up of the believers, not the building. It is the believers around the world. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. And we just pray, Lord, that we would look up to you and realize that all prophecy is being fulfilled and will be fulfilled before you return. In your name we pray. Amen. This is Advent Sunday. Advent means coming or arrival. Advent has those two meanings, coming, and Lord, we're waiting for the Lord's second coming, and also the arrival. He's already arrived. So these Sundays before Christmas, I'll be speaking on Christ's first coming and his second coming. I preached last Sunday on his second coming, and this Sunday on his first coming. Now, as we think about Christ reveals that he is the promised Messiah. Christ reveals that he is the promised Messiah. And so as we were mentioning, Christ himself said when he read those portions from Isaiah, today the word is being fulfilled and I am here. I have fulfilled it and I will be fulfilling it. Now in Nazareth, they knew him. They knew Jesus. He was raised there with their children. How can this guy say that he's the Messiah when we know who he is? Isn't that interesting? A prophet is never accepted in his own community. They just see right 
missed everything. You see, when Christ was growing up, he was a carpenter just like his father was. In those days, you were what your father was. If your dad was a farmer, you then became a farmer. If he was a shoemaker, you became a shoemaker. Now, Christ was a carpenter because his dad was a carpenter. And so it seemed to be around the world. This is really what it was. And a lot of times the names indicated what you really were and what your profession was. So here we see that Christ was a carpenter. So they looked at him. Well, he's just a carpenter. Yes, but that's what his father was. And so the idea, now we get in our heads, we see the picture of Jesus. And generally we see a frail person. You know, now I want you to understand, I worked on a farm too. To be a carpenter, you've got to really do work. And in the hot sun too, Jesus was not, Jesus was acquainted with hard work. And for him to carry the cross as long, as far as he did, and he'd been beaten, so his back was totally open, and he carried the cross as far as he did, it only tells that he was a hard working man. When he was growing up. Something for us to remember. So Christ is some kind of a frail. Pale looking fellow. I really don't think so. And we will see Christ one day face to face. It's going to be really. Really wonderful for us. Who know him as our personal savior. But now Christ. So they said well he, he was just a carpenter's son. Yes he was. But then he left his dad's carpenter shop the place where he worked and he went off with the prophets for several years there's no we just don't know how many years that Christ was and that's the prophet studied out in the desert and that's where he was studying also with John the Baptist his cousin and so we see Christ was well studied in the Old Testament in fact he knew the Old Testament almost by heart he did. Because he made reference to it. He didn't pull the scroll out because that time they didn't have little New Testaments or, or, or little Bibles or that. No, it was a scroll. And those are really big. If you see the synagogues, when the rabbis come with the scroll, I mean, it's big. It's a two rows like that. And it comes carrying it. So Christ had the whole Old Testament memorized. And so wherever he went, he taught from God's word, memorized. He knew it in his heart. And remember when he, in the Beatitudes, in chapter 5, all the way through 7 of Matthew. And then at the end he talks about the two houses, that one was built on sand and the other one was built on the rock. And when he came to the end, the people stood in awe. If you remember, you go back and see that at the end of chapter 7, the end, that's a long sermon, 5, 6, and 7 of those chapters in Matthew. But the Pharisees said, this man preached. And the people too, he's not just preaching like the Pharisees. The Pharisees admitted, wow, he preaches better than we do. He's the man of God. This Jesus Christ, he's not just the carpenter's son. This is a lot more because he believed it. And he was concerned about the people every day that he walked with them. That not one should be left behind. Christ wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. And this is God's view of the world. So Christ reveals that he was the promised Messiah. First of all, he understood the working man. Secondly, but the people thought, well, he's just a carpenter's son. But secondly, that he proved that he was a prophet by what he did. There was no other person that could feed 5,000 people, that could make the blind man see, that could raise the sick and cure them, and also raise the dead men, that Lazarus who'd been in the grave for several days. That was truly the Messiah, the Son of God. And he proved it. Number two, Christ proves that he is the promised Messiah. First of all, Christ reveals that he is the promised Messiah. And now he proves it. And as we think about the proof, 
a lot of people and a lot of Paul's prophets have come along and they can say a lot of stuff. They can say a lot of stuff, but okay, now prove it. You prove that. I remember Jim Jones. Anybody remember Jim Jones? Okay. Jim Jones led his people, led a group of close to a thousand people out into South America. One of Ganya, I think it was. But anyway, there he set up his cultish village. And he made them drink this grape juice that was laced with poison. Because they'd rise again. And so would he. You know, you can say a lot of stuff, but prove it. And he shot himself and the others, how many hundreds were killed? I don't know, just hundreds of people scattered out over that whole area. All dead. And so is the claimed prophet that he'd rise again. Christ talked about he rise again on the, on the third day, and he did. He did. So Christ proves that he is the promised Messiah. And he proved it. And all could see. Number three, Scripture reveals, Scripture reveals and proves Christ's second coming. So Christ then therefore says, I prove to you and you've seen with your own eyes, you've seen with your own eyes, what was talked about me in the Old Testament, I fulfilled it as I went along these three years. And just as I proved that I am the promised Messiah, all the scripture that talks about the second coming will happen. Word for word. And you don't need to doubt it. Because it will happen. The only difference is when people mark days and say Christ is going to come on such and such a day, wrong. Because Christ said, no man knows the day or the hour that I will return. Not even the angels in heaven. Not even the angels in heaven. God knows, Christ knows, but not the angels. And we can't set the date. But his second coming is imminent, and every day that goes by, he just marks that it's one day closer to his return. Now, just so that we get things straight, we say, well, wait a minute now. That's about 2,000 years ago that Jesus walked on earth. And he said that, you know, people thought that he was going to return pretty quickly. But remember, in Scripture, it says a thousand years. A thousand years is like a what? A day in God's sight. So really, let's just say it's about two days that Christ returned to heaven. It's about two days ago in God's eyes. So don't get yourself all riled up about this. Well, you know, I hear this all the time in Brazil. Well, it's been 2,000 years. Yes, but that's like two days in the eyes of God. So time in our day, in, in our eyes, in our life, is really a, a short run when you think about it. Even if you live to be 100, that's not even a day in God's eyes. A thousand years. Out. We're just kind of like Moses said, you know, we're like vapor. We're like grass here and it's cut and then we're shriveled up. We come on the stage of history and we leave pretty quickly. Think about it. And so as we look again, as we come to the end, and we're looking now at the conclusion, this Advent season should make us more anxious for Christ's return. And like I said last Sunday, and I hope, and I, I'm saying it again this Sunday, I pray, I hope and I pray that nobody is afraid of Christ's return. That to me is the worst thing the worst fear that you can ever have. It should be a glorious time. I'm waiting for Christ's return. It's going to be the most blessed time to see the hear the trumpet. Because Gabriel and all his all his legions of angels will be blasting the trumpet. And around the world it will be heard. And then bright light will come and Christ will return. And we shall go home with him.
Is there anything greater than that? That's just really exciting. Let me tell you, there's not a, there is not a film or a show or anything that could ever, ever be made that would be like Christ's return. We can never imagine it. But it's way beyond. It's way beyond our thoughts and our comprehension. But it will happen. So I am looking forward to it. It is my prayer that each one of you are too. And that to teach your children to love Jesus. And I always say, how are you doing on your earth walk? Because that's the main thing. As we come to the end of this year and starting a new one. Coming up in days. As my third grade teacher told me when I came back from Brazil, Connolly, how are we doing on our earth walk? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. You know, but that, then I, the more I thought about it, that is really true. We are on an earth walk. Some have more, more days on our earth walk than others. But God has given us X amount of time on our earth walk. Let's make each day count for Jesus. Can we reach out to somebody? Can we pray for somebody who's struggling today like Jesus did? Give hope to the hopeless. Read this again when you're at home, what Christ came to do, and he wants us as his disciples to do likewise. But he's got the power. It's all in Christ's hands. So I just want to... In closing, I'd just like to wish you a blessed Christmas. Sorry that I can't be with you these two Sundays, but God will bless you and you'll be greatly blessed. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the new year. And I do also want to thank you again for letting me walk with you these few days as last year. And to me, shepherding the flock, there is nothing to me that I love more to do than shepherd the flock. And that, to me, is what it's all about. And whoever the Lord chooses as your full-time pastor to live with you, because to be pastored by a pastor, somebody has to live with you. I'm just kind of a partial one, you know? <laughs> but the, we're looking for a pastor to live, like Pastor Young and his family, to live in the community with you, to love you, to walk with you, and to be part of, of your life. And that's what Jesus was with his disciples and as he walked on earth. So anyway, I just want to again just thank you and I just uh, pray God's blessings on you. I also want to thank those who opened their homes this last year too. Being born and raised on a farm, I, I do love the farm and I, I do miss the farm, by the way. And, I, I, and I just, it's just a joy to, to be with you in, in your homes too to get to know you better. And so I just thank you again for those who have opened their homes to me this year. And so let us, let us pray. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you again for this beautiful Advent season. I just pray, Lord, that you just anoint each person here to sense your presence and that Jesus said, and lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world, the end of time. Lord, we just pray that we will just sense your presence now as we think again that you came as a child and as a baby to this world in order to die on the cross to save us from our sins. But the second coming will come as the King of Kings in all glory and honor and the whole world will see Christ's second coming. But there will be those that will be left behind because they did not know you, Jesus, as their personal Savior. So we get, commit this day in your hands now and the rest of our lifetime, each one of us. In your name we pray. Amen.